You welcome back. This is our front. My name is Raymond Dalqua. My guest today was one of those who stopped the Rawlings led uprising on May 15, 1979. He has actually played several roles in Ghanaian military, and as he says it, he is sometimes at the right place or the wrong place at the right time or the wrong time and has been part of Ghanaian history in various forms. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, join me, welcome. Captain Retired Ebenezer Budukumsen. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. I hope you are doing well today. Yeah, sure. Now, you have your own scars in Ghana's history, let's be clear, but let's start from when you joined the military. Well, uh, I joined the military in 1974. Okay. I think it was June, April, around that time, 1974. That was during the reign of a champion. That was, yeah, early days of General Achampo. What made you join the military? Uh, two things. As a child growing up, my dad was one of the first black army officers. Oh, I see. Who joined, I think around 1958, if I can remember right. He was a captain. He was the first black chaplain in the Ghana Armed Forces. Mm -hmm. So I grew around the military guys. I saw General Ankara, when he was commanding the first battalion in Takrade. Oh, I see. When he was left Lincoln, and my father was a chaplain. Mm. So I grew around them. I grew around General Kutuka and uh, Afrifa. We were all around the same barracks in Kumasi. I was okay. going to their houses. It was uh, Kutuka's uh, command uh, land river that would take us to school. Mm. You know, so I grew around them. And I remember as a kid, sometimes I would sneak into my father's room. And they had this tall mirrors. And then I'll put on his cap. And look yourself in the mirror. Under yes. my arm and then salute myself. <laughs> oh, that's an interesting one. So but, the inspiration was from the family. Uh, yeah, I mean, my, my mate in elementary school, West Kwe Practice School, Atapeni, mm. he joined the boys' company. And I would have loved to join the boys' company, but my dad wouldn't, I wouldn't dare. You okay, know? I see. So we had to go to secondary school, and one thing led to the other. So I actually had that love. For the, military. for the military. Another thing is, um, I, I'm not an A student. You really? know, actually, I wanted to do uh, read uh, business administration in Legon. Mm -hmm. And that time, it was uh, the in thing. It was pretty new. And mm -hmm. so I really didn't get my three A's or three B's. Mm -hmm. I was an average student. And it oh, was okay. very competitive. So mm -hmm. I had to go and do English, geography, uh, no. Things psychology, history, and those things, and my dad said, "No, no, no, boy, you are not going nowhere." Okay. So I said, "Well, oh, he had taught all the registrars in the three universities at that time." Okay. So I said, "Then call Uncle Bruce. He was in uh, Kibasu. Call this <laughs> uncle in the Legon, and maybe they will get me a good course." No, no, no. You don't call nobody. Mm. You sit down and get the better grades, and you do exactly what it is that you want to do. Okay. So I rebelled. Oh. You know, I mean, I don't like sitting exams again, so I rebelled, <laughs> and I said I wouldn't. So I, I had become a problem at home. Then uh, General Utuka visited my dad once in second D, and I was a cobola running around with the, uh, I had finished sixth form in Fansipi, and uh, I was just running around with the, the seamen in Takra, this guy in Takra, mm -hmm. you know. And then my uncle actually was that major Aqua who was killed with the judges. Oh, Sam Aqua. Yeah. He was a colonel. Oh, in the Kwame Nkrumah's regime. He was demoted. And then uh, he had taken me on at uh, paper conversion, and he was always advising me that uh, mm -hmm. I should come down and go back to school, like the old man was saying. And then uh, Utuka joined, came to visit. And he asked the old man, what is this boy doing here? I said, well, I haven't finished uh, university, and I have to finish my university before I get to do what I want to do. And then the, the, the general asked, boy, what do you want to do? I said, I want to join the army, but the old man won't let me because I wanted to join the military sixth form okay. after O levels. And not after university. I had passed. He just got them to take out my application from that place where I couldn't. So I went to France for sixth form. Mm -hmm. After sixth form, I wanted to join. Still wouldn't let me because he wants me to have a profession before. So when the Utuka saw me, I told him this. I said, Oh, Papa, so, Papa, so, but you, you chop your soldier finish. Let this boy to chop his soldier. Oh, what's your trouble? And he said, no, no, I should get my profession first. So behind my father's back, he made me a sign to call him. Okay. <laughs> so I called him, and then uh, he asked me to see the adjutant in Apremdo. 
I want to see the adjutant in a premier and there was an enlistment going on. By the time my dad could say Jack, I was in Accra, he had to come and look for me at the academy. <laughs> You're already enrolled. <laughs> That's an interesting so one. So I actually wanted to join. And so was General Ike Utuka that took you to the military? Sure. You knew him very well. Yeah, he knew my dad very well, not, not me. Yeah. You know, my okay. dad knew almost all of Of course, you were then, so you were not... Uh, not, not me. Yeah. But then, uh, at that time, he had even finished his uh, stint at the staff... I was the command, commandant of the uh, staff college or wherever he was, but he was living on the academy campus. So I knew even as a cadet, I would sneak Sundays okay. into the house and Mrs. Utika would give me some small soup to drink. Oh, that's and wonderful. Also, <laughs> okay. Now, let me get this clarified. How was the military when you joined it? Ooh. If it, when we joined, I had seen the military since 1958. Because mm. you were born into it. Yeah, I wasn't born into it. I was uh, 58. I was like five years, six okay. years. <laughs> okay, to be fair. But then I had seen the military since that time. And so when we joined, it wasn't like we saw, but it was still good. Mm -hmm. The mess life was still on. As a young officer, in the evenings, you have to dress and put on the long sleeves or put on your tie and you go to the officer's mess. You know, in those days, we had the single quarters and we were fed centrally from the officer's mess. And we were sneaking our girls to the single quarters. <laughs> and then, and then the, the commanding officer or the, the, the two ICU or the adjutant, who was, he, we hear that they are coming on inspection, we have to hide the woman, uh, spread the girls away. <laughs> it was fun, you know. Interesting. So that, it was fine. And in the units, for instance, I served in two companies. First, I was in B Company, in 5th Battalion, and then in a support company. And I could tell my company commander on Friday that, Sir, this weekend I want to take my platoon on field exercise. You know, the whole space between Burma Camp and Bachona was bush. Okay. We had Black Man 1 to Black Man 12. They were marks, you know, between there and the military academy and the staff college, Teshi. The whole thing was bush from the airport. So it was a training area. And my, com my company commander will ensure that I've got a vehicle, I've got rations, I've got what I need, and I'll take them to the bush area and bash them around and come back on Sunday, you know. And uh, for me, it was very exciting. <laughs> but I for see. the soldiers, they were married. You know, I said, this small boy, be queen, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but so you were free. I could sign for these, uh, that uh, uh, bullets, ammunition, and go and have fun in the bush. I mean, okay. practice what we had learned. Mm -hmm. So the military was still, the life in the military was still good. Just that gradually, gradually discontent was setting in, you know. Discontent. Do you want to jump on time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the early years or the latter years? Well, I, uh, what was the early years and what were the latter years? Because, the I 70, actually, because I you joined in 74. 74, but I graduated in 75. Okay, yeah. And I started doing one, two, one, two jobs in his residence around 76. In a so, Champos residence? Yeah, yeah. But by 77-ish, I, I had gotten stuck there as a guard commander. Oh, so and, you were uh, guard commander at the time? Yeah, I was the general's guard commander, uh, residence guard commander. And uh, we were stuck. And that time, uh, UNIGOV had, what, they were trying UNIGOV and it wasn't working. And uh, young, even young soldiers or young officers, we couldn't even go to town with our uniforms because at Tariya and I guess in the fire ship, you know. <laughs> where you, you dress in this, your uniform, and then yeah. you, go, you don't have nothing in your pocket. But with okay. the uniform, you could, you, you could talk. You know? Okay. It got to a stage that we weren't even allowed to go to town with our uniforms because the civilian populace had become so restive. Everything was... Uh, okay, there's a lot of tension around. Tension around, and then there was what you call control items. I mean, control prize and yeah, yeah. all sorts of things. I remember... They said that, that the military people were the ones compelling people to sell a control prize. Sure, I and remember... And sometimes they were abusing them. Right. I remember my own experience. I was almost sacked from the army the very first month on after graduation. And I will never forget it because um, I was a second lieutenant and I had come to 5 Battalion. My whole problem started with when I came to 5 Battalion. Originally, I was supposed to go to 5 Battalion. Mm. But then General Champon saw me on the parade ground. I commanded our intake and he said, boy, he saw my father and they took me there. And so he knew my father has asked mm. me where I was going. I said, 5 Battalion. He smiled. By Monday morning, my postings had been changed to Fuad Battalion. <laughs> I think that was the beginning of my problems. Oh, I see. Now, let me get this clarified, too. So, 
How was the tenor of a champion getting to the tail? I mean, some have talked about the things she's done, the infrastructure development, operation feed yourself and all of that. You were young then, but did you experience some of those? Were they good times? Uh, yeah, they were good times. I would say they were good times. Well, I realized and I saw the tension out there with the mm -hmm. Unigov. Yeah. But I was not political. Mm -hmm. Let me dis yeah. Yeah. I was just there making sure that I do what I'm supposed to do. And uh, sometimes we'll have to warn our contemporaries who are in Legon and they're like, well, if I come on the stakes or you come on demonstration, I'm going to do it you. against you, I'll beat you up. You know? <laughs> there was that general tension, you mm -hmm. know. I remember as a second lieutenant, like I was saying, we passed out in November and I got to my unit and in December, I had to, I went on operations and I arrested an articulator load of sugar, mm -hmm. you know, in the night. And then I got my boys to evacuate it to the barracks. I was a hero the next morning in the unit. You know, you laid ambush, you arrested these smugglers, mm -hmm. and you brought it. I was full of energy, you know, only to be told that I had arrested the wrong art, uh, articulator. Oh. And that four cartons out of the whole, almost a thousand boxes were missing, and I had stolen sugar. Really? Not knowing that the sugar belonged to the wife of General uh, Bokote. Oh, and I, I had see. arrested the <laughs> army commander's wife, Sugar. And I was now being charged of having stolen Sugar. <laughs> and that I should return the whole consignment and apologize. That oh. was how bad things were getting. Okay. Because I knew the, the commanding officer, I, I knew the commanding officer when he was the second lieutenant in Kumasi, mm -hmm. I was a small boy. You know, I, I knew a lot of them. So I looked at the commanding officer's face and told him, I wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Second lieutenant, I said, sir, I can't take this sugar back to town. It's not going to happen. They marched me out of his office, and he knew I was right. Yeah. So you see that the acts of indiscipline had already started seeping in. Okay. But finally, he got them to t return the sugar, and my first pay was seized. Pay? To pay for the four cartons four, four of Four cartons that yeah, were apparently to, missing. I had to hand over my pay slip to the commanding officer upon receipt. So I had to go to my uncle, Mr. John K. Richardson, that time he was the MD of uh, PTC. And uh, he saw that uh, his soldier boy was very morose. He asked me, Papa Soldier, what's wrong? I said, it's bad. <laughs> what's wrong? And I told him that story. He asked me, have you told your dad? I said, not yet. I said, don't tell him. He went into his bedroom and I said, how much is your pay? Those days it was peanuts, you know. Mm -hmm. How much was the pay they seized from you? He, I told him. He went to his bedroom and brought me my money. He said, case finished. Oh, everything is settled. Stop, stop frowning. <laughs> Why was Achampong removed? Achampong actually was removed because of general discontent. Was it more Unigov or more about his general governance style? I, 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 I tell you, I wasn't too political and I haven't bothered to. But okay. I, and I know that Unigov brought about a lot of friction and tension. You, you, you work in his office or home? Home. Yes, you work in his home. Yeah. Was the claim that, I mean, he was exchanging women with cars and all those true? You heard that claim? I heard it. I heard it. Uh, it's, it's exaggerated. There what was no golf for what, women with big There could have been a for two, but <laughs> he was not... He but was you're not, not dismissing the He entire. was not Kowus, you know. He created Kowus. So it could be that he'll give you a note to go and see Kowus that look. Okay. If, because those days, everything was being rationed. And you're talking about Kowus motors, actually. Yeah, Kowus motors. Those mm -hmm. days, everything was being rationed. So I could even imagine that if you had money to buy, they would tell you that wait for six months or one year. And mm -hmm. so if... You knew the old man, and the old man gave you his red, uh, green ink. Definitely, you get preferential treatment. But whether it was one woman, one golf, that one, I don't know. Because I was, <laughs> we saw a lot of women in the house, though. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Now, that was a point that many used against him too. So they also raised issues to do with corruption. Was he corrupt? A champo himself per se. Have you ever heard anybody proving? That he actually amassed wealth? No, not proven. I mean, as claims. That yes, was. that is the issue. Mm -hmm. That was what people were put, putting out there. Yeah. But I can understand because we, even we, the, those in the military, were angry because we had this funny feeling that the officers who had been sent on secondment, mm -hmm. like housing corporation, state fishing corporation, these senior officers, Coco Board, Coco Board yeah. these senior officers were being promoted in tandem with their colleagues who were still in uniform. In the barracks. Okay. So therefore, even the senior officers themselves were angry among themselves. And they saw them living a more affluent life than those in the barracks. Meanwhile, 
rations were being cut. Everything was in short supply. You okay. know, his famous uh, uh, that thing yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. repudiated his, uh, the, the, the national debt. And it caused a major constriction because even when he had the money, the big powers wouldn't even sell him the spare parts to fix the vehicles, to give him the, uh, the, the equipment. Okay. I understand even the mines were grinding to a halt because oh, even if you had the money, they wanted to cripple him so you wouldn't even get spare parts to buy. Oh. You understand? So there was that tightening of the noose around him. around him. So definitely things were really, really tough. And especially those of us who were close by him were feeling the heat even from our colleagues. Oh, I see. You go into the mess and you realize that some of them wouldn't talk if you're around. Mm. You know, they felt you, you, going you could, to, you could yeah, feel they, it. Yeah. And uh, the tension was, was rising. And especially when they said, I understand in Mokola some, or somewhere, some market women spilled urine or something on soldiers in uniform as a sign of disgust against the whole armed forces. Yeah. And the soldiers were mad with such things. And then they said that we, none of us could even go to town in uniform. Yeah, you mentioned that earlier. So, now, so, so how was it removed? Oh, it was a palace coup. Mm -hmm. I remember I was a residence guard commander and Felix Aksari was, uh, was the ADC. Mm -hmm. And um, it was bubbling. You could feel the tension between General Champong and the SMC2. Is it right. the SMC1 or SMC2? Yeah, one, I see he SMC1, came one, yeah. yeah. Because um, he, it got to a time he would give us instructions that he doesn't want to see any, any of the generals in the house. So if he says no general will come to the house, you come to the gate, we turn you back. We could feel it. His colleagues. As, yes, especially shortly before his overthrow. It happened one morning. He was not well. He was at home and he was on excuse duty. And we had been told that he didn't want any, he was not going to receive any visitors at home. Normally, when he's coming home from the office, they will send us a list mm -hmm. of people who will be coming to see him in the evening at home. And at home, we will manage him. When he goes out, Felix will manage yeah. him, you know. And then General Kufu wanted to come and see him, and he was the CDS. And I knew General Kufu when I was a Form 5 student in Tamale. He was the commander for a para battalion. So I knew him very well. And General Kufu was coming to see General Champon at home. It was a morning around 8, 9. And the old man had said he wouldn't see anybody. So we heard the bugle from Reiki Regiment, from Arakan, that they were blowing the, 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 the general salute bugle. So my, my sergeant and myself quickly went to the gate because we had to relieve that poor private soldier or okay. corporal standing there. And it was also drizzling a bit. So we went and I told him to step aside and I stood at the gate myself. And then they came in, the bar was down. They would expect the bar to go up with the flag coming. Mm. So I kept the bar down. My sergeant was standing next to me, ramrod. And then the, the car stopped, and I saluted. And they were expecting the bar to go up. It wouldn't go up. So finally, he lowered his window. <laughs> and Father Wolf, we used to call him Father Wolf. He had these big eyes. And that oh, big I see. Mustache. Big alcohol food. <laughs> yeah, and if he stares at you, you know that yeah, someone is really staring at you. Then he looked at my face, and I was looking at his face. He said, what's happening here, young man? I said, uh, nothing is happening here, sir. So what do you mean? I'm coming in and what's happening here? So, so we've had orders that nobody is expected and the old man doesn't, is not prepared to receive any visitors. He said, do you know who I am? I said, yes, <laughs> sir. That's my CDS, sir. <laughs> and I said, the old man is not expecting any visitors, sir. Then his ADC, who was sitting on his side, put the, he said, he did this to me, he said. <laughs> Don't <let him laughs> Don't. Okay. You know, so... I suggest that, sir, I think you want to call the old man yourself. Because I haven't had any instruction. And I wasn't about to go inside and ask him. So he rolled up and he left. And I knew he had left. Not knowing he went to Arakan Officers Mess. Okay. And I had two commanders. If the president was home, I had to take instructions from the home. But then I had my battalion commander too. Mm. So I got a call. My battalion commander said I should come and see him. 
And uh, Kufu had been gone for like 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Me. Okay. So you didn't So care. I told my sergeant, okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to battalion headquarters and I'll be back soon. So I went to see my battalion commander and he sent me to Tema to go and get some roofishes or something for the unit. Because somehow at that time, with my face on TV and around and with the champion, I used to get things done. Okay. So I went to Tema, got everything that the unit wanted, came. And as soon as I got to the unit, I realized that the atmosphere was wrong. Mm -hmm. So I got to my unit at the residence. And my sergeant himself was standing at the gate as the, as the guard. So I said, Sergeant, what's the trouble? He said, about the trouble come. I said, what's the trouble? I said, the old man has, sacked, has asked that the guards should be locked up. First, they locked the two poor soldiers. Then they locked the session commander, the corporal. Now he is the one standing on the guard himself. Now, if he locks the sergeant, you go and go, lock, I will be the next person to lock up. So what happened? They said, when you left, General Kufu came back. And the poor soldier, when he saw the flag, was flapping. So he just lifted the bar. And I understand there was heated exchange of words in the residence. Mm -hmm. And he threw a, a Kufu out. You know, so we real tension was yeah, really, was really, really problem, building. Yeah. And I remember one morning, dawn, around 3 o'clock, 3.30, I was doing the in internal patrols. And the old man was also walking around. The, he used to walk around the compounds a lot. Then he knew me. He used to call me Papa Sofu because he knew my father. Okay. And then we sat on the edge of the gutter in the residence and said, he knows outside there is not good. Mm. But his generals around him are always telling him that it's good. And he knows outside the wall is not good. Barely a month after that, he was overthrown in the palace school. That morning, he was not supposed to go to work. The First, day of the palace school. The day of the palace school. So normally around 7, 30, 8 o'clock, we mount the guard. He, he fills out and we salute and everything, and he's gone. By this time, the, the dispatch riders were there, the vehicles were there, and he wouldn't go out. So we knew he wouldn't go out. Felix finally said that every, we should stand down. So we stood down. Barely 15, 30 minutes later, we were told that the old man was fully dressed and he was coming out. So we had to scramble, and he left. Maybe he got a message or something, whatever. So he left for Ministry of Defense. That time it was at uh, Burma Camp. Mm. So around 9.30, 10, we heard who, who, that there's been a coup. Something was happening at MOD, Ministry of Defense. I was at the unit, and our commanding officer was not in. But the company commanders were there. Nobody was telling us anything. So the RSM told me that, Baba, he used to call me, Baba, something is happening, so I should run to the residence and secure the place. So I ran to the residence and we secured the place. And then, lo and behold, we heard there had been a palace coup. And the head of state had been taken, was being taken away. And as one sergeant major, Adam Bela from C Company, he, on his own initiative, took a small detachment to the Air Force Station Junction and saw Odate's convoy taking a champong out and stopped the convoy. Because those days they were really scared of high battalion. Okay. But he had stopped the convoy. He saw these generals, but they didn't know what to do. So allowed the convoy to go through, and that was the unmaking of a champo. Where well, they took him to the Air Force Station and I stand a helicopter or something, took him out. Then we got instructions that at about 11 o'clock, they had made the announcement and all units were to stand down and stop fighting. And I said, no way. I have trained all this time for this fight. I won't stand down. So my unit was still on stand two, and we were looking for where was he because we would have stormed that place. Well, we were so gung-ho. We thought we were invincible, you know. Yeah. And then they sent my own friend who was uh, that time uh, Lieutenant uh, Kwasi. He became Brigadier General Kwasi, Johnny Kwasi. I used to call him Johnny Kwasi. He said, Kwasi, Kumsi is your friend, so you go and tell him that he should stand down because uh, he is being stupid, he is resisting. Because five battalion has stood down. I said, I wouldn't st stand down. So Kwasi came and said, Budu, they've taken the old man away. So stop this nonsense and stand down. Otherwise, we put all of us into trouble. I still refused. I see. Because my sergeant on my side said he was in the president's old guard regiment. And when they, when they surrendered, the way they beat them up and maltreated them, he wasn't going to accept it. So we refused. Until around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, when they came with the vehicle that we were supposed to go and carry the colors at the airport. Meanwhile, my own friend, Usa Babio, was in the vehicle. 
red light was in the vehicle. And these are people we knew, and they said, I should join them to the airport. We knew that it was a trap, because as soon as we left the house, we knew we would be arrested, because we had refused orders. Lo and behold, as soon as we got to the airport, well, when you are told to carry the colors in the military and you refuse, they can suck you. I see. Even if the colors fall down, they can dismiss you. So we went to the airport and the engineer regiment detachment, they surrounded us and they arrested us. I managed to bring our flags to 5 Battalion. My commanding officer was there. And I said, sir, they are taking us away. They said we should go to brigade. Well, I, then I was scared. My commanding officer looked at me and said, look, if they say go, you go with them. I was aghast. You see, these are some of the things that did that split between young officers and senior officers. Okay. So he actually threw me to the, under the truck. Okay. So we went to brigade headquarters, Osa Babu and myself. He, he ended us up as a brigadier general, Osa Babu. We were made from school and all those things. Then we were put there under close arrest. Then Odati Wellington came to brigade headquarters. He had finished a coup. He was the most powerful man in Accra. And all the generals were around and so I said, could you let's make noise? Well, they had locked up in the room and I was scared that if nightfall caught us there, someone will come and kill us. Oh, I see. For those days, they will kill you easily. You know, so we started making noise. I banged on the doors and all that. said, what's that? They said, oh, the president guard commander, so they arrested him and he's in the room and misbehaving. He said, bring him out here. Say they brought me out, and I marched in front of him, and I was literally possessed. I went straight into him and saluted, and apparently I was shouting on top of my voice. He said, sir, why have I been arrested, sir? I wouldn't even let him talk. What have I done? Why have I been arrested for doing the right thing? I said, who are you? I said, I'm Lieutenant Budukumsi, sir, Commander Residence Guard. I asked him again, why have I been arrested? So if I am not released, I will tell every young officer, at the least sign of danger, don't run. Kill your commander before you run. That's Be what you said. That's what I told him. I said, because you taught me to defend you to the peril of my life. And that's exactly what I was doing. The whole Ghana Armed Forces and my unit has stood down. I said, I won't. I will fight. What have I done wrong? But that to look to me, I said, <laughs> Mesa Wood, that, that, Mesa Wood was a commander okay. engineer regiment, and his unit was a point unit for the coup. Mesa, didn't I tell you before that nobody should arrest any five battalion officer? Now Mesa Wood, trying to arrest her for his points, was losing points. Okay. So he said, go to your unit. I said, sir, we don't have any car. Then he called his driver, take them to their unit. In their haste, they forget to take the flag from in front of them. Mm -hmm. And I went and sat at the back, comfortable. <laughs> so as the car was going, everywhere we got, pa, 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 general salute. So, oh, so you received a general <laughs> salute. <laughs> you know, and it happened in Ababa, Ababa Camp Junction. It happened in Agonda. It happened in Fire Battalion. And now commanding officer who said, oh, you go. Because I thought he had thrown me under the, under the, under the truck had heard that Odati was coming into the, his unit, so he was coming to salute and take his, okay. take his points. He came, the car had parked, he saluted, the hand was even still up. <laughs> I'm I, waiting for it. I took my time to come out here, just flipping left and then coming out of that car. I see. I looked at him, he looked at me, and his hand couldn't even come down. I think he couldn't believe what he was seeing. Yeah. I just looked at him and just left him and went to the residence and sat there. So did you continue your role as a lieutenant after the, of course, presidential guard command, you're no longer the commander there? No, 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 no there's nothing. But I went to the residence because the family was there. Oh, I, I was see. so naive those days once my orders had not been changed. I was you not going back to the yes, place. I went okay. back to the residence. I didn't care what was going to happen that night. I was going to defend the family. Okay. My unit was still intact. Mm -hmm. They just took me out and back, so I went there. And nobody had the nerve to tell me to surrender. No, no, nobody. I see. But then I was there and there was nothing to do. So after some time, I heard that Odati asked, where was that boy who was causing trouble? I said, he's still at the rest. I said, what is he doing? I said, he's taking care of nonsense. Send him to the, his unit. So they pushed me back to my unit and somehow I became the adjutant five. Mm -hmm. And that set me up for my next fight with colleagues. That's May 15. <laughs> yeah. Now, I want us to zoom right into it. What happened on May 15? Oh, that was barely a year. 
less than a year after a champion had been taken yes. out, right? Yes. Then the trials and all those mm -hmm. things were going on. And they were, I think, arranging to hand over. Yeah, they said so they did for election the and all election, of that. Yeah, you know, the generals themselves were that tired. They wanted mm -hmm. to hand over. And there was this general constant discontent in the armed forces. And you could feel it. When you go to the mess, nobody could possibly even d defend them anyway. But you see, the face of the discontent was gone. That was Achampo. Mm -hmm. But five, at five battalion was fiercely loyal to Achampo. Mm -hmm. So even though Achampo was gone, they, they really didn't know what to do. Mm. They really did not know what to do. And there was discontent, too, that their commander, because Achampo had commanded five battalion before, okay. and was actually living in Arakan barracks okay. as a head of state. So there was that general discontent in five battalion that they'd taken our boss away unceremoniously, and we couldn't fight. Mm. So there was that discontent. But then, 15th May, in the morning, I think we were getting ready to go for fiscal PT, you know, we call it PT, in the morning. And then we had shots in Reiki Regiment or in our unit because we were in the single quarters. So at that time, I was the adjutant. So I quickly changed my, 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 my PT dress into uniform and ran to the unit. I, I met General Usa Bebio, who was a lieutenant also at that time. Okay. And I called the IO, who was uh, Johnny Kwas, uh, uh, General Kwasi now. Mm -hmm. So we went to the battalion headquarters. What was happening? And the duty officer had run away. <laughs> because Rollins had come to the unit with an armored car. And when he saw him, the duty officer had actually run away. And we needed the keys to the armor and the magazine. So quickly we, we got him. He was an, an NCO, a non-commissioned officer. So mm -hmm. we got him. And we took the keys from him. So we, our problem now was to rally the troops around, make sure they don't disperse. Because if they disperse, you can use them. So the unit officers started rallying the troops around. And I went to our commander's house. Our commander had, was on pass. He was in Lome, Oting and Oting. So we had no commander. But the two IC was around, not knowing that Rawlings had already gone to Major Suleiman's house and tried to shoot him. And Sule had jumped through the to the back of his, through over the balcony of his house, and went into the bush and was trying to rally the recce chaps okay. uh, to come out with the amok to challenge that single amok that was running amok. And um, I went to our, uh, the two IC's house, and my two IC too was not around. I heard he had been shot in the thigh. So we were there, and so we had to take initiative. So we rushed to the battalion quarters, and we got the keys, and we went to the armory, and we were just drawing out enough weapons to give to the boys immediately to start fighting. Luckily, Johnny Okai, who was also a lieutenant Okai, he became a Ken Okai, was at a standby company. And when Rawlings got there, because Johnny Okai was with the boys, the boys couldn't join him. They were scared. So Rawlings came around. He left. We were in the process of dishing out the weapons, and my hands were really full. I had all sorts of guns and things around my And then Rollins' armor car just drove into us. Oh, I see. He just drove into us, and we froze. We was, and he stopped in front of the armory, and he was standing on top of his armored car with the SMG, the one with the small, small holes. Yeah. And he, the gun was pointed at me, and I was just staring up at him, and he at me. And the soldiers and the armor car were telling him, shoot him, sir, shoot him, shoot him. He just stared at me, and he wouldn't shoot. He stared and stared and then hit the armor car that they should leave. I said, well, thank God. It was a wrong mistake. So immediately gathered the boys, those anti-tank boys, mm -hmm. to go after him with the cargo staffs. And so somehow he abandoned the car and ran away to Air Force Station. When I got to the car, there was nobody inside. It was first they wanted to blow up the car, but I said, no, wait. We wanted to see, because they were so stationary, as I started, they yeah. had abandoned there. When we were low and it had been abandoned. So we saved that car. And then by this time, Sule had managed to rally his, the armor the regiment around. You said you had Major Raider here yesterday? Yes. After we secured five battalion, Lieutenant Kwasi and myself, Lieutenant Kumsin, that time we were lieutenants. Mm -hmm. We took the unit, we had a, an, an Audi. I remember it was a blue Audi. And we wanted the recce regiment officers to bring out their cars. Somehow, they thought that fire battalion was the enemy. Because anybody firing at you is your enemy. Mm -hmm. But it was Rollins who had fired and he was one. So 
Kwasi and myself, we saw Rida, and we started chasing Rida with a car. And he was running away from us. So we actually were like cowboys chasing a cow. You know? oh, <laughs> we had to chase him and hope. He said, Sir, oh, Kwasi, we are not enemies. We can go bring out the cars. That's how they went to bring out those cars. And uh, say, uh, Sul, uh, Major Sule, mm -hmm. and the arrest managed to finally arrest Rawlings at the, at the Air Force Station. Now, I mean, these are episodes I want to have proper understanding of. Was June 4th inevitable? June 4th, I think so. You so it was a momentum that was gathering. Because between 15th May, mm -hmm. and what even annoyed them that those of us who they thought stopped the uprising were decorated on the Paris Square the very next, <laughs> next opportunity. Or that they came and decorated us. Oh, I see. Mentioned the dispatches, get the medal for bravery, and mm -hmm. the others were pissed that we all did something, but nobody, we were not oh, recognized. So it also even brought problems. And then I started receiving hate mail. You? Yeah. I was the adjutant fire battalion, and I had helped to put this thing down. And it was apparently a popular uprising. Mm -hmm. So we started receiving hate mail that your days are numbered. Every day, we will kill you. We will do this. But you, there was nowhere to run to. You yes, would just true. have to do your job and know what is happening. But we got wind of June 4th. And we knew that the boys were planning something. And we knew it was not going to be officers. It was going to be the junior ranks. Well, there were all sorts of rumors going on. So why wasn't it stopped? I think it was overconfidence and bad command. Bad command? Yeah. I'll tell you why. Well, I, I was not the CEO, so my CEO, those, that, day, that CEO is still alive, so I should be very careful. I see. <laughs> but that's Ken Oting. He's now my big brother, you know. He's a prisoner. But I remember I was on course. I don't know which course. But then I came to the unit uh, on Friday afternoon. And I saw these boys, the young officers who had passed out, they were coming to report to the unit. And they were shabbily dressed. So I even saw them, what, who are you? And they said, young officers coming down. I said, and you are dressed like this, so I sacked them. And I went and told my CEO, I said, what are we doing? If at this time of the day, we should have stand to. Stand to means emergency, everybody, you know. But I couldn't see. I said, sir, when these things are happening, we arm ourselves. We give emergency orders. And, but but can I told me that the entire fire battalion was on standby. Yeah, but that was later. You see, the rumors were rife. Okay. The rumors were rife. And some of us thought that those we knew or had heard were in the midst of the coup plan. and should be arrested or something. But apparently, like I said, I, was, I didn't have the big picture. Okay. And I was so fired up, I was making noise. So my commander said, that your friend, Kwasi, the father is dead, and they are making his a year. That's uh, that weekend. So I should go. She go to the funeral. Stop causing trouble in the unit. OK. So I went to Takwa, all the way to Takwa to help my friend Saturday. And then after that Sunday, instead of sleeping over and boozing and come on Monday, I drove through the rain and everything came to a crash. Got there around 8 p.m. And I was not supposed to be around. And you could see, you could cut the tension in Burma camp. Really? The lights were off. And then you could cut. Everybody was on. Now they were on standby. What I had said earlier and I have been thrown out to go to Takwa. Mm -hmm. Now they were on standby. Everybody was on standby. And I got to my room. And as soon as I got to my room, they told me that Ranger Mensa says that CO says I should come to battalion headquarters. I said, I won't come. You know, that, that was, you see, indiscipline had eaten into our fabric already. I said, I refused. You know, and I understand. I wasn't there. That batch and four could tell you better, yeah. or the CO himself could tell you better. I understand that they even knew where their boys were going to assemble to start the coup. Instead of arresting them or killing them, they laid an ambush. And guess what? In the ambush, Kodyo Bwachijan was one of the commanders with Fritz Atipu. That is my company commander. Mm -hmm. Fritz is a don't want trouble type of CEO. And Bwachijan somehow had been fingered in the 15th May thing. And Rollins is his friend. And they were all now in cohoot. You understand? I get you. So, Instead of springing the, 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 the ambush at the right time, 
They did it. And so they lost the initiative, and the first shot ran out, and there was then confusion. Bachampo and those who were there can tell you better. I can only tell you where I got involved. That's true. Mm -hmm. So they said the cry was, kill all officers. And it was 1 AM. I read that said it started in the night. Mm -hmm. And the volume of ammunition being fired, I thought everybody in Bama camp was dead. <laughs> I wasn't there. Meanwhile, an armored car had driven to the singing quarters and fired through my house. Mm. So I had to run, because the new adjutant wife was there, and those I had run. And my wife was seven and a half months pregnant. Oh, so I, I ran out of the room, only to hear her shouting, so I had to come back into the room and take her out. Mm. And I think that is what saved me, because I would have run to the unit, to go and not knowing that all the officers had scattered. So we were in the bush, playing hide and seek with these soldiers who were firing sporadically into the bush. Until about 5.30, 6-ish. And then we heard noises in the bush. So I knew that now the soldiers were coming into the bush. And they were going to kill us. And this is my seven and a half month pregnant wife. I really didn't know what to do with her. So I, I just put her at a, about a meter or two distance from me. And went to the side that I would drop one or two people. And they would kill me so that she wouldn't be killed. Okay. I had my gun fixed. And I saw somebody come in white shirt. White shirt. You are like a silhouette in the mm -hmm. night. You are at dawn. You, you know. Seen, yeah. And this guy was fast. Ah. Then I read it was Cheme Jang. So I still wouldn't lower my sights. And then the next I saw Mrs. Bwachijang. Then the next I saw Kujo Bwachijang. So I called him, sir, sir. He almost dropped. <laughs> so he dropped and said, I said, sir, what's happening? He said, oh, if he has seen me, then we are the only two of us alive. But they've killed all officers. Mm -hmm. But from 1 a.m., the noise was kill all officers. Not knowing that, no, there are plenty more officers alive. And okay. this guy is telling me that. And I said, no, 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 no. I've heard Ranger Minsa's voice at the armory, so we should go and help it. We were talking when our voices went high. So somebody fired into our mess. And I think maybe because I was a coward, I just dodged, laid down, and I think I laid down too long. By the time I got up, sir, sir, sir. Wachijan was gone, Chiremejan was gone, my wife was gone, his wife was gone. I see. Yeah, everybody had left you there. He had taken them away. I understand they went to Achimota. Then, now I said, okay, now I'm free to fight. So I decided to join <laughs> Ranger Mensa at the armory, at the magazine. I crawled like half a kilometer or so, just crawling, because you can't stand. And then I got somewhere behind a champion's residence, that area, and someone had a maize farm about this high, and had weeded the maize farm the previous day. So it was like no cover. And it was 8 o'clock, the sun was coming up, so I laid my head down to rest. I was tired, so I slept. I see. The next thing, I think I was dreaming, I heard something pressing my head into the sand, and something, someone screaming and screaming. I wanted to lift my head, and I couldn't lift my head. This idiot. <coughs> Some uh, one Tete Mate, Lieutenant, I thought he was another rank, had the barrel of the G3 in my ear pressing into the ground and just screaming that I was a bad guy and this adjutant that would kill us. So I asked, what have I done? You know, we exchanged words. One thing led to the other. So I said, if you make noise, the guards at a champion's residence will kill us. They will kill both of us. So he kept quiet. Then he asked me to go into a thicket. I said, I wouldn't go. Well, if he, I went into the thicket, I knew he would kill me. You know, the people who commit murder don't want people to see them. And then, oh, that one, he really did beat me up. I see. <laughs> yeah. He kicked me with anything and everything with the butt of the gun. I said, I wouldn't go into that thicket because you killed me. Then he said, okay. Then I said, he said one thing. He said, you are lucky I'm a Christian. I said, oh, my father is a priest. I said, why is it? You are a Christian, my father is a priest. You want to kill me? I beg you. They said, okay, is there a way out of here we can run? I said, yes. Well, I knew that area like the back of my hand. Because you've been using it consistently. Yeah. yeah. I said, there's a gap in the fence. So we could go through that gap. And then he said, I should get up and lead the way. As soon as I got up and we wanted to go, not knowing that my laces, the boots, I, could, I did not finish lacing my okay. boots in the night. So it were loose. And this twine, like, you know, this twine mm -hmm. had entangled it and I fell down. 
out of fear or whatever, this boy emptied his barrel, the, the, the magazine. Into, the, pop, 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 into. Then he I, shot you. Yeah, he shot. Then I felt something very sharp and hot on my right side. I thought I'd been shot. I said, why? They said I wanted to run. I said, I'm not running. The grass caught my leg. Not knowing that, I don't know. The bullets actually missed me. Mm -hmm. But the stones on the ground cut me up mm -hmm. mercilessly. You know, so I started bleeding. And he said, if you try any monkey tricks, you will kill me. I said, okay, but there's the gap. So he said, let's go. So we went. We got to Bachona. And not knowing that the soldiers had seen that the officers were running through Bachona, railway station there. As soon as we got over the ridge, the soldiers were they fired at us again. And I was in front of this guy. So we ran back and we were running. We ran and ran and ran. Now we were going towards Tishi Academy, you know. And then we, it was a, it was, the sun was high, about 10 ish, getting to 11. And then uh, we got to this watermelon farmer's farm. And we were really thirsty. And we wanted to drink some water. We saw a calabash. Out of nowhere came this guy with a cutlass. In the middle of a coup, this guy comes with a cutlass. And this Tete Mate was just standing behind me. I don't know whether he was transfixed. I just turned around and we managed to grab his G3 from his hand and fight in front of the, the farmer, which okay. caused him to run. Okay. Now I had a gun. I said, now you take the lead. So I took him to Teshi and handed him over to Major Mensa Gbedema. Mm -hmm. Mensa Gbedema was standing there watching Arakan. It was like a cowboy cinema, you know, mm -hmm. boom, boom, with the bones. All, and I told him what was happening. I was made to brief the commandant what had happened, what was happening in, academy, in, the, in the Arakan. Because so far, nobody, we were just killing ourselves in there. Nobody really knew what was happening. What was happening. So I briefed him, and I was made to go and brief the brigade commander also. So we went and briefed the brigade commander. And we were told that one captain uh, um, from engineer, Kwekudia, from engineer regiment had been sent to Burma camp with reinforcements to free the senior officers. And had made some successes, but meeting stiff resistance around the Ministry of Defense. So they wanted one battalion to go and reinforce them. That one battalion officer is still alive. He told the commander in the face that he wouldn't go. I thought they would kill him. But the commanders were weak those days. Me, if I were the brigade commander, I would have killed him. But he said he wouldn't go. And lo and behold, as soon as he entered, finished, the, exited the gate, instead of going towards Bamaka, he went towards Akema and went back to his unit. Mm. We were there until they came and arrested the brigade commander somewhere in the afternoon. Why? I don't know. But when they were coming, when we got to brigade, I met Major Sule, Major Sulemana, uh, Major Sita, and uh, Lieutenant Hatcher. These were the three officers with three big armored cars, almost ties flat, full of bombs and ammunition, waiting for orders to storm Burma camp. But they were there until they came, the soldiers came, they arrested the brigade commander and the senior officer Sule and the rest, they ran away. Mm -hmm. So these armored cars were there. Luckily for me, one of the drivers, the leader of the drivers, Bempa, was my father-in-law's cousin, or Wafasi. So he asked me, sir, what do we do? I said, go and hide in the cookhouse, because you will wreck people are the enemy. If they see you, they will kill you. I see. I thought that the, the armored cars had keys, not they had switches. So they took out the switches and went and hid in the cookhouse. So the guys came, they took out the senior officers and left the armored cars there. Mm. So after a while, when these wrecky boys came out, they came to me and asked me, sir, what do we do? I said, we go to Burma camp. They thought I was crazy. I said, what do you want us? One of them said, we should go towards Togo. I said, we won't even have fuel to get to Togo. Someone will kill us. We should go to Takrad. I said, how? We can't run the gauntlet. I said, let's go to Burma camp. Fight and secure some territory and see what will happen. I didn't have any plan beyond that. Somehow those days, I was so naive, I thought I could do anything. Mm. You know, I just was spoiling for a fight. So I asked them to show me how to traverse these guns, you know. And then we started driving towards Burma Camp. And then after Palm One Junction, going to Burma Camp Junction, some guys made a mistake and fired on us. So the three armor cars all started, we released the guns on them. No resistance. 
we go to Congo Junction, we went straight out. There was always this structure at Burma Camp the Junction. Within one minute, it was gone. We took everything. I was scattered everything. Then got to Congo Junction, and I didn't know where to go. Now the boys were shouting at me because they were afraid to be stationary. You know, yeah. these are mockers are afraid to be stationary when they are fighting. Sir, well, sir, well. And if you go straight, we will meet my own unit. They will kill us. Burma, Ministry of Defense, too, I understand, had fallen. So line of least risk, I said Air Force Base. We zoomed to Air Force Base. Within one second, I had dismantled the gate. We drove around the Air Force Base. Within one minute, two minutes, we had conquered Air Force Base, and then I had a base. I said, you see, I told you. Now we wait for a knife. They asked me why. I said, I don't know, but we have a base. Someone will come. You know, so around that time, Wilberforce came. One Captain Wilberforce. That time I was a lieutenant. He said, Budu, your name is all over the place. What's wrong with you? The generals have been taken and you are still causing trouble. I said, ah, but if I stop fighting, they will kill me anyway. So they'd rather fight and then we die. So he said, what do you? I said, let's go to five battalions. Somehow, and I was a battalion adjutant. Somehow I thought if I get to that unit, I will be able to make some sense out of the whole nonsense. But it was naive. It was, I was a target. So we got to Fabata Batana, I asked them boldly, where is Bacham for? Because I heard that Bacham for was the one in charge. And we were friends. We were all from support company. So they told me he was at the, uh, at the school. So I just jogged, without a weapon. Jogged towards the school. And I understand the boys were discussing, shoot him, shoot him. Who was going to shoot? And then one staff sergeant, um, the MT staff sergeant, I remember the name, warned them that whoever shoots me, he will shoot him. So that's how I survived. I went there and Bach and Fox me. I met also the, the mortar guys going to shell brigade headquarters. Well, Bach and Fox was a mortar officer for Fabat. So okay. he liked using the mortars. Because he had used the mortars on Reiki Regiment in the morning mm -hmm. and was going to use the mortars on brigade. I said, they should come back. Because they knew me. When I said they should come back, they obeyed. So Bach and Fox was pissed. And so when he saw me, I said, good word. I said, the, the fighting is finished. That's what he told you. As I was, I and we, before we came and told him, look, the fighting is over. We finished. I have brought the three remaining. Ammo. I didn't say that I, I, I have them. I said I had brought the three remaining Amor cars, and then the fighting is over. You know, in the process, he, he showed me all that is uh, blood soaked aplets mm -hmm. on the ground. And the other officers with him were sitting on the ground, apparently under close arrest or God knows what. In the midst of the talking, I had confusion behind me. I turned around, and the Wilbur Force who was taking me to Five Battalion was actually the one now being beaten up. I see. So I ran, picked him up, dropped him in the pin square, and drove away. Nobody shot me. Back mm -hmm. to Air Force Base. So I realized I was not welcome there. But somehow I have, I have survived the first foray into that unit, and I was never going to go back. So around 4 o'clock, we were there. And we had put out a ground defense, and we said we were going to fight until everything was finished. But then we were scared that Bach and Fo would use the mortars on us. So, that, so the boys asked me, so, so what? I said, we pray. We pray that we survive. We survive. If we survive this night, we will survive. Then around 6, 6.30, against my instructions, they allowed a Pinsgua to drive into Air Force Base. And I was mad. When I came out, it was Vachijan. I asked them, why did anybody let this car come in? Meanwhile, where is my wife? Because he had and all wife. this nonsense I was asking about my wife. I you see. Know? And he said, oh, his wife mm -hmm. took my wife to my father at Calvary Church around 4 o'clock. So I said, take me to my father. So we drove to Calvary. And when we got there, yes, she was there. And then we drove back, back to Burma camp. I, I was coming to Burma, back to Burma camp. My mother was going berserk. I said, you're going where? I said, I'm going back. We are fighting. My time has run out. This is a conversation we should continue pretty soon. And I'm sure we will continue that. Especially, I want to know how you also resisted the second coming of Jerry John Rawlings in that particular conversation. Uh, that's something that we will talk about later on. But well, that's where we end today's edition of Upfront. Many thanks to you for joining us.